Yeah, Hatch and Pete, baby! Man, I am so happy to finally talk about a DCOM that's not the Sweet Life movie. Get that weak stuff out of here! I posted a poll on my channel about which DCOM I should review next, and Starstruck actually ended up winning. But, don't fear Starstruck fans, the video is still coming. I've already watched the movie and wrote down some notes, I even have a thumbnail ready. I just felt like Hatching Pete, being the underrated classic that it is, deserves a little more attention right now. Besides, Goku2241 says it should happen. I can't let him down. No, but seriously, has anyone else ever noticed that there are only two kinds of DCOMs? There is the musical cash grab franchises, High School Musical, Camp Rock, Teen Beach, Cheetah Girls, and then there's the other kind. The Hatching Pete kind. The Dadnap kind. The Smart House, Minutemen, and Up Up and Away kind. The ones where Disney actually tried to come up with something different and fun instead of musical with the gimmick number 17. These ones, actually in a way, kind of felt like risks because of the fact that they were based on such a wide variety of topics. Disney had no idea which ones would flop and which ones actually would succeed, and unfortunately, most of these wildcard films didn't do nearly as well as the musicals, with a big portion of them flying under the radar. One of them, being Hatching Pete, a movie with a stacked cast and a unique premise that I remember being quite fond of around the time it came out. But nearly 15 years later, it's time we put it to the test and see if it still holds up. My name is Mr. Nostalgia, and today I will be discussing the Disney Channel original movie, Hatching Pete. Straight. You're the chicken? Yeah, but somebody else was in the suit, right? It's not me. That's you. He's brash and bold and daring. You can live your whole life in a shell, or you can hatch. You can hatch. The Disney Channel original movie, Hatching Pete. Coming soon to Disney Channel. Hatching Pete premiered on the Disney Channel on April 24th, 2009. The casting for this movie is pretty elite. We have Jason Dolly, a Disney Channel legend, playing Pete Ivey, a shy kid who doesn't get much attention despite legitimately being cool and funny. Mitchell Musso, another Disney Channel legend, plays Cletus Poole, Pete's best friend. He's selfish, self-absorbed, and worst of all, his name is Cletus. What's funny is that throughout the film, everyone refers to him as Poole, his last name, including his sister. It's never addressed in the film, but it's very possible that everyone realizes how dumb of a name Pletus is, so they just use his last name instead. I'd do the same, honestly. Joining those two goats, we have Tiffany Thorne from Sunny with a Chance. Oh wow, look at me, still talking about Sunny with a Chance cast members. You'd think I would have moved on by now. She plays Jamie, a mean girl. If you've seen her as Tawny, then you already know what to expect. And then, if that wasn't enough, Arwen, aka Brian Stepanek, plays the coach in this movie. Most of you know him as Arwen from the Sweet Life franchise, but real Disney Channel veterans know him from his critically acclaimed miniseries, Brian O'Brien. <laughs> I can't believe I just made that joke. The movie opens up with Mitchell Musso's character Cletus. You see, Cletus is the mascot for the school basketball team, a basketball team that is notoriously known for being bad. They're basically the 2012 Hornets. The thing is, Cletus hates being the mascot. Not only does he lack the personality needed to properly be a mascot, but he's also literally allergic to the costume. That's where we enter Pete Ivey. In his opening scene, we see him walk up to his teacher to ask where Cletus's sister Cammie is, only for her to mistake Pete as a new student, despite him literally being in her classroom. Now, you see what they did there? Within the first minute of his character's introduction, we already know his role in the movie thanks to this scene. What better way to set up a character that isn't known by anyone by literally having him not be known by his own teacher? Genius filmmaking, Scorsese would be so proud. Meanwhile, Cletus starts to flirt with some of the cheerleaders while in his mascot costume, in which they all give the same disgusted reaction. Cletus isn't liked by anyone, and rightfully so. He gives off serious, hey, where my hug at, guy energy. Not even his own sister likes him. Speaking of Cletus' sister, it's also established pretty early that Pete has a crush on her. He tries to ask Cammy out, but gets interrupted by the star, and I mean that loosely, athlete of the basketball team, Dwayne Dill, her boyfriend. 
Of course, the cheerleader gets with the captain of the basketball team. It wouldn't be a decom set in high school without it. Pete drives home all upset and whatnot about how he missed his opportunity with Cammie, as we're greeted to a shot of their house that is also attached to the bakery Pete's family owns. They don't do anything with this subplot. Their bakery serves zero purpose in this movie, and they legit could have just gotten rid of it and nothing would have changed. Wasted set piece. We're also introduced to Pete's dad. Okay, everyone, brace yourselves. It's a Disney movie. Let's see if he's the token single parent. Oh, wait, nope, nope, his mom's there. Never mind. Okay, don't worry, we still got time. Every DCOM has a token single parent. It's practically in the rule book. Pete's parents talk to Pete about coming to the basketball game tonight, but Pete says he doesn't want to go. Just then, who walks in and greets everyone? Okay, as you'll see throughout this movie, Poole is legit one of the worst Disney Channel characters of all time. He's a horrible person and a horrible friend. But Mitchell Musso's portrayal specifically is just so... Is there a word for charismatic but in a negative way? Like he's so good at being this terrible character that it actually makes me like the character a bit more. Mitchell Musso really is the GOAT, man. Like have you guys heard the in crowd? I wonder what it's like to have it. I, you know what, I'm getting completely off topic. Poole tells Pete that he needs to do him a favor and be the chicken at the game tonight because his allergies are really bothering him. And because of the fact that it's a family tradition passed on from generation to generation, Poole doesn't want to quit it completely. Although hesitant at first, Pete accepts the job because Poole says he'll put in a good word with his sister. At the game, Pete is completely lost and has no idea what to do until he realizes that he needs to give the crowd and the cheerleaders something to cheer for. That's when he starts dancing around, falling on the floor, mocking the coach, and sitting at the other team's bench. And everyone is loving it. People are laughing, even the cheerleaders think it's funny, and because of Pete's amazing job, everyone at school the next day absolutely loves pool. Well, not everyone. You see, both the basketball team and the coach have an issue with the shenanigans that Pete did during the game. Because of this, they meet up with him in the boys' locker room to, uh, teach him a little lesson. The coach stops them, though, before things get too crazy. Question to anyone that's seen this movie recently. Does this scene seem a little off to you? Like, it truly doesn't feel like it belongs with the rest of the movie. Brian Stepanek's acting here actually made me a little intimidated. That's just my theory. I don't like you, Poole. Huh? I don't like the chicken. Get it? Okay. I wish I could cut those boys loose. Play patty cake with your face. But I'd lose my job. And that is the only reason you are still upright. What did I do that was so bad? Oh, don't play dumb with me, Mop Top. You know what you did out on that court. This is where the main conflict of the movie starts. Poole is starting to get all the glory and attention for being the chicken, or rooster, technically, while Pete gets absolutely nothing. The only part of this I don't understand is why characters like Jamie suddenly start falling in love with him. Everything that the chicken is doing is just basically what a normal class clown does, yet class clowns generally aren't the ones that get the girls. I should know, because I was said clown. I guess one explanation could be that Tawny, I mean Jamie, likes him purely because he's basically the most popular guy in school at this point, and she sees this as an opportunity to move up even higher in the popularity ranks. But even then, later on we see that there's another character who we haven't met yet that also starts to fall for Poole. And I'm like, is it really this easy? Should I have been the mascot back in my school days? Would that make up for my lack of W Riz? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Anyway, Pete gets asked if he wants to sign up for the float committee where they build a float for the Rooster Day celebration. That's when Angela Morrissey, a new girl in school and member of the cheerleading team, volunteers to do it with Pete. After having a successful brainstorming session during the float committee club or whatever it's called, Pete catches up with Angela and talks to her about some of her genius ideas that she had. They get to know each other a bit, and just when Pete starts to spit some game to her, she drops a bomb and says that she has a boyfriend. And, to make matters worse, he sees Jamie and Poole seemingly becoming closer and closer, which doesn't make him very happy. Unlike some main characters of DCOMs, <coughs> Starstruck, I actually do feel really bad for Pete. He wanted to do his buddy a favor and actually had a pretty fun time doing it. But now, it's getting a bit out of control and his best friend hasn't been acting very friendly to him. It's honestly pretty funny how we have both one of the most likable characters in a DCOM ever 
and one of the most unlikable characters in a DCOM ever, in the same movie. Poole swings by and asks Pete about what he did during the game so we can get a better understanding why most people love him and a few people hate him. The original proposition from Poole was that he wants Pete to teach him his routine, but it eventually turns into Pete becoming the chicken once again so Poole can watch from a distance in the crowd while wearing a disguise. <laughs> I guess Mitchell Musso is in the, the in crowd now. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Pete starts doing his thing, getting the crowd involved, dancing around, and just overall acting a fool. At one point, he notices Angela laughing at him, so he kidnaps her? It's like, nah, I'm just playing. He just runs her to the hallway. He gives her a flower and then pulls a Batman when she turns around, disappearing into thin air. This literally doesn't make any sense, though. Where could he have possibly gone in two seconds? Bro thinks he's a Flash. Uh, the other one. This is a big mistake, and one that I wonder why Pete even made to begin with. She's literally calling him Cletus the entire time, so she's under the impression that it's him. Why he decides to flirt with her anyway, knowing full well that she thinks he's someone else, seems like a weird thing to do, considering Poole earlier in the movie already felt the effects of Pete's actions as the chicken. But hey, decom logic, am I right? In the scene after this, Pete starts complaining about how Poole is getting all the glory while he's going back to be the kid that no one knows about. And in response to this, Poole literally just ignores everything his friend just said and tells him that he's going to be the chicken full time. He thinks it's a win-win, but in reality, anyone with a brain could see how this is definitely an L on Pete's part. Yet Pete accepts it anyway? This is probably the only issue I have with this character. He so far hasn't put his foot down, even in situations where he gains nothing out of them. He also somehow doesn't see how terrible of a friend Poole is to him which seems odd to me considering Pete is supposedly supposed to be a pretty smart character. And, as if things can't get any worse, Angela, the girl he's been crushing on, starts to ask him about Poole while they're building the flow, as she begins to build a bit of interest in him. She does this despite the fact that she's already in a relationship. Hmm. Very interesting. She belongs to the streets! Pete is interested in Angela, who's interested in Poole, but the only reason why she's interested in Poole is because she actually thinks he's Pete. So it's kind of a love triangle? Does that still count? I don't know, I was never good at that kind of stuff. The basketball team arrives via bus to the opponent's school to take on their squad. Cletus and Poole switch places while Cletus goes into the stands in his disguise once again. Things are going pretty good for a while. Well, not really, the basketball team is getting blown out, but for Pete, things are going pretty well. That is, up until the opponents start to make their way over to the basket where the cheerleaders are standing under. Because of the fact that it's Pete under the suit, and not Cletus, his first reaction is to save his crush, Angela, not Cletus' girlfriend, Jamie. Which leads to this. Thanks a lot, Cletus! <laughs> I don't think so. Oh, Poole's gonna hear about this. I'm <laughs> um, gonna hear about this. Okay, so no one gave me an answer on this, but is this the first time a DCOM has shown blood? I mean, granted, it's not a lot by any means, but like, I don't know, this kind of surprised me when I first saw it. If this was Nickelodeon, I wouldn't have blinked an eye, though. You can totally see all the- I still don't know how they got away with that. Afterward, while Poole and Pete are switching places, Poole starts chastising Pete for saving Angela instead of Jamie. In the middle of doing so, they get a knock on the closet door, and as it turns out, it's Angela. So anyways, thank you. Okay. I, um, I guess you're kind of my superhero today. Hey. She belongs to the streets. So she genuinely has a crush on Cletus, all because of his mascot shenanigans. Again, has it been this easy the whole time? Alright, jokes aside, this writing is kinda stupid. I mean, come on guys, it's a chicken, or rooster, whatever. No girl is falling for a mascot, and if she did, she wouldn't belong to the streets anymore. She would belong to, like, the Sesame Streets. Yeah, she'd be chilling with, like, Elmo, and Girl Elmo, and Oscar the Grouch, and Will I Am. Now that song goes crazy though, if you know, you know. Despite being as hard-headed as ever in the scene, Poole seemingly does a complete 180 in the next one, where he cries out to Pete about how he feels bad about the whole situation, 
and that he feels even worse about the fact that his dad is super proud of him, even though he hasn't done anything at all. Oh, by the way, the streak continues. Cletus is presumably in a single parent household. He only ever mentions, and we only ever see, his dad throughout the movie. There's no mention of his mom anywhere, which makes me think that they either split up or she died. Classic Disney. It's at this point where Poole apologizes to Pete. He even tells Pete that he might be better off forgetting the whole pretending to be him thing and come out as the chicken. But Pete's main concern is that he thinks once people find out that he's the chicken, people would be disappointed because he's just boring old P. Ivy. So he convinces Poole to keep the cat in the bag at least until after the parade. Later we find out that Angela's boyfriend from her old school broke up with her over text. Ha! Loser, loser. Pete catches up with her and comforts her, and I, I, I don't know, man, this scene was kind of lame, not gonna lie. I don't care about romance stuff, I just want to see funny chicken do stuff. Fortunately, we get that in the next scene, which takes place during the parade, which features the float that all the kids have been working on since the beginning of the film. Cletus comes in, dressed like Woody from Toy Story, a much better disguise than before. Pete, dressed as the chicken, emerges from the egg, which I gotta say is a very impressive set piece for a bunch of teenagers. Oh snap, it's the song, it's the song! If you've seen my so random video, you know how I feel about this song, bro. It's such a banger. Okay, let me snap back to reality for a sec. There's a part during this little dance routine where Angela runs into the crowd and grabs Poole, and I'm still not quite sure why. Obviously, she doesn't know it's him, so we can assume his costume played a part in her selection, but if she wanted crowd participation, why wouldn't she choose someone who's actually wearing chicken merch? What does a cowboy have to do with ducks? And the only reason why this happens is because now, thanks to Angela's weird decision, Cowboy Cletus' hat falls off, and it's now clear to everyone that he is not in the chicken suit. Cletus? Uh, who's, uh, who's this Cletus you speak of? I get that you needed everyone to find out eventually, and I don't blame you for doing it during the parade scene because that's where it would hold the most weight. But why not just say it's windy that day and have Poole's hat fly off so he runs in the middle of the parade to find it, but then everyone ends up seeing who he is? Or maybe someone in the crowd is dancing and accidentally knocks it all from behind, I don't know. But there are so many better ways you could have done this scene, it's not even funny. What makes this scene even dumber is that once they realize what's going on and the chicken runs away, literally everyone chases after him because it's apparently that big of a deal. Pete steals the sheriff's car and drives away so he doesn't get caught. But like, again, it's not that serious. If they caught him and just took the mascot head off, everyone would see it's just plain old Pete Ivy, which as far as I know, impersonating a mascot isn't a crime. Why Pete felt the need to steal a car to get away when the cat was already out of the bag is beyond me. I guess maybe that's part of the joke is that everyone takes the stupid mascot way too seriously, but if that was the case, then it could have been executed just a little better in my opinion. At the sheriff's office, it's revealed that the sheriff's car was found, but that the chicken was no longer in it, meaning Pete had ditched it. Poole's dad picks him up at the sheriff's department and they have a talk about why Poole did what he did. At the end, Poole's dad, instead of getting mad, instead of grounding him for lying, instead of even saying, I'm disappointed in you, says the exact opposite. It says that he's proud of him for sticking with the mascot costume for as long as he did. So basically, he's a jerk to pee all month, or however long this lasted, almost takes the girl that he's crushing on, lies to Jamie and basically everyone in the school, and gets away scot-free. And you want to know what Pete is doing during all this? That dude's running from the ops! Eventually, he dumps his suit in his car and goes for a walk, when Angela drives by him. They talk for a bit about the parade and the chicken, who his identity really is, blah blah blah, until Angela says that although she does want to know who he is, once the mystery is over, so is the magic. Remember those words. The next day, Poole swings by Pete's house for a chat about what to do next. An interesting thing to know in this scene, and for the whole movie in general I guess up until this point, is that Poole never actually apologizes to Pete for how he treated him. He apologizes that he got caught, 
and he apologizes for the fact that it's made Pete's life a headache, but he never apologizes himself for everything that he's done. And during this scene, Pete isn't too happy to see him, and I don't blame him. It would have been nice if Pete finally put his foot down and just told Poole off, even if it's in a nice way. He deserves to hear it. He's genuinely a bad friend. Anyway, because of everything that's happening, the whole town is sad that the chicken is no more. It's so bad to the point where they just leave in the middle of the basketball game because there's no funny cock a doodle doo man. This leads to them coming up with a plan to show whoever is behind the chicken costume that they miss him and need him back, even with everything that happened in the past. All of this commotion gets back to Pete, who agrees to go on the school talk show dressed as the chicken to discuss why he left. They modified his voice so no one can tell who it is, but thanks to a very specific line of dialogue that he says, a certain someone was able to figure out his identity. His magic's in the mystery. Once you know, the mystery's over. And so is the magic. Back at the house, Poole is trying to convince Pete to continue with being the chicken. Because of the fact that everyone misses him and wants him back, the sheriff agreed not to arrest him for stealing his car. That's not Pete's issue though. Pete's issue is that once people find out who he is, they're going to be disappointed. I feel like that they're literally just redoing the scene from earlier, but whatever. And that's when Poole offers him some very sound advice. Then you need to look at it like this, man. I mean, you can live your whole life in a shell, or you can hatch. Roll credits. At the next game, which is the very last game of the season, there's a lot at stake. I mean, not really because the team is terrible, but they're basically just trying not to go winless the entire season. They start playing, and things aren't going as planned. They're playing like trash, they're unmotivated, and they're all giving that James Harden on defense energy. The coach calls a timeout, and when they're starting to get huddled up, all the lights go off. The principal brings in a chicken signal, an obvious parody of the bat signal, and shines it at the roof. And as the light begins to expose a figure in the sky, we see it is none other than our hero, Pete Ivy. Dressed up as a chicken one last time. I'm not going to question how he managed to get all that stuff set up without anyone noticing, because this scene is just way too epic. He flies down and through the banner, topping it all off with a flip. Attaboy Pete! Or uh, chicken! I knew you'd show up! <laughs> Alright, when I first saw that scene, man, I'm not going to lie, I thought it was his sister. I was very confused for a good nine seconds. He still shouldn't have done that though, regardless. Oh snap, they're playing the song again. I'm gonna cry. Honestly, I had a big smile on my face during this scene. This movie is just so stupid and at times takes itself too seriously, but I just don't care. All of the problems I had with it kind of just went away during this scene because it was just so much fun. And sometimes, that's all you need to have a good time. Had this dude doing the warm and stuff. This is great, man. Alright, that's enough. The team comes up with some plays to dig back into the game, one of which leads to a dunk performed by the team captain. These are my favorite kinds of third acts in any genre, honestly. Seeing everything come together, people discovering new things about themselves, I mean, sure, it's been done a million times, but hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Slowly but surely, the team starts to chip away at the lead. They tie it up, and during a timeout, P starts hyping up the crowd. As he watches them cheer him on, he realizes that maybe after all this time living his life in a shell, it is finally his moment. His moment to hatch. So, he begins to take off his mascot head, and while he's doing that, he receives a little assistance from Angela, who is already aware of his identity at this point. With his mask off, he's staring into the crowd, wondering what kind of reaction he'll get. But then, the silence quickly turns to a loud, roaring cheer. Pete's fears were no longer relevant. He hatched, and everyone loves him because of it. Also, Mitchell Musso starts playing the jump for some reason. I don't know why. The team is super pumped up now and have all the motivation in the world to win the game. They get a few defensive stops and are now only trailing by two points. They do one final play that leads to the other team turning it over and Dill catches the pass, shoots, and of course... Rejected by Anthony Davis. 
The stadium is shaking. The fans have never seen anything like this in their lives before. Davis is unbelievable. The crowd is chanting MVP, MVP. Shoots and of course, scores, which gives them the W. And speaking of Ws, and well, here you have it folks. That was the story of Hatching Pete. I think Hatching Pete is a pretty solid installment into the Disney Channel original movie catalog. One that I don't think a lot of people talk about, which is interesting too, because I would argue that it's better than some of the ones that people do talk about. Yes, it can be cliche, and it wasn't the funniest or most well-written movie at times, but it wasn't just objectively horrible like the Sweet Life movie, or what matters even more to me, insanely cringeworthy like the Camp Rock movies. Boy, if you don't get it's also not trying to be anything brand new or groundbreaking, which I honestly prefer. It's a pretty simple movie with a pretty decent story that's executed pretty nicely. I also appreciate the overall theme in the movie. It teaches kids to build up their self-confidence and self-respect. And I mean, I'd say that's a pretty good overall message to teach children. The only real flaw I have with the film is the handling of Cletus' character. I mentioned it earlier, but it did bother me how he treated Pete and just about everyone else with blatant disrespect and got away with it, having zero consequences. I mean, he lied. Isn't lying bad? Shouldn't that have also been a message in the movie? Would have been kind of cool if Cletus had some more repercussions for his actions. After that though, that's pretty much my only real issue with the movie. It's a DCOM of course, so I had to suspend some disbelief, but overall, it's pretty solid. What do you guys think about Hatching Pete? I would like to know in the comments below. I'd also like to know what other DCOMs you want me to review in the future. If you like this video, please leave a like and subscribe if you haven't already. I'm Mr. Nostalgia, and I'm out for now. Peace.